Can you guys see it? We can. All right. I hear nothing. How you get to hear? Uh, unchair. Are you on a PC? I'm on a laptop. Yeah. All right, go ahead and do the share again, and you'll see down in the lower left-hand side, share computer sound, the checkbox. Okay. Drivers responsible for all the laws and regulations Good. that apply yes, to commercial vehicles. All right. Making sure each vehicle is properly operational is essential to our ability to fully perform each and every day as expected by our clients. This video will help show you the essential inspection process that must be performed on each vehicle every day before it is released to perform any work. It is important to understand this process to assure that the vehicle will pass a DOT inspection and to assure that it is safe and operational before the crew departs for daily activities. Every vehicle inspection requires a 360 degree walk around. The starting point is the front. Check for puddles under the engine that might indicate a leak. Check that the truck is not leaning to one side or the other which could indicate a suspension problem, low tire pressure, or a shifted load. Check the lights on the top and front of the truck. They must be a proper color and not broken, loose, missing, or dirty. If there is a headache rack, grab onto the post and pull. The headache rack must be securely mounted by its bolts. Check to assure they are not broken, loose, or missing, and there is no debris. Same for the cone holder and the front bumper. Now, open the hood and check every item that contains fluids and their attached hoses. The power steering, windshield wiper washer, coolant, and brake fluid reservoir should all be securely mounted by their bolts. The bolts should not be broken, loose, or missing, and the reservoir should not be leaking. Their hoses should be securely mounted by their fittings and clamps, not frayed, cracked, or leaking. Check the oil. All fluids should be at or below full, but above add. Now check the engine components, alternator, water pump, power steering pump, and air compressor. Each should be securely mounted by their bolts. The bolts should not be broken, loose, or missing, and any fluids should not be leaking. Look to see that all wires are secured and not frayed or cracked. Check to see that the belt is not frayed, cracked, or loose. Press on the center. It should not give more than three quarters of an inch. Next, make sure that the steering shaft is securely mounted, not cracked or broken, and there is no excessive play. The power steering box should be securely mounted by its bolts. They should not be broken, loose, or missing. It should not be leaking. Check to see that the hoses are securely mounted by their fittings and clamps. Make sure they are not frayed, cracked, or leaking. Now look at the pitman arm and drag link. Make sure they have their castle nuts and cotter pins present and they are not damaged and securely mounted. They should not be broken, loose, or missing. Finally, look at the upper and lower control arms and tie rod. Check that they are not damaged and securely mounted and the bolts are not broken, loose, or missing. The following needs to be checked on all wheels. Check the spring mounts, front and rear bracket, that they are securely mounted by their bolts and are not broken, loose, or missing. Check the leaf springs are securely mounted by their bolts and U-bolts and they are not broken, loose, or missing. The spring should not be cracked, broken, shifted, scissoring, or missing. Look to see the shock absorbers are also securely mounted by their bolts and are not broken, loose, or missing. It should not be leaking. The rubber bushings should not be worn. Check to assure that the brake line is securely mounted and not frayed, cracked, or leaking. And on an air brake truck, check that it is properly secured by the brake chamber, which is not dented or leaking and is securely mounted by its bolts. The slack adjuster and push rod on an air brake truck should be intact and its pin present. Make sure that there are no broken parts and the push rod is at a 90 degree angle to the chamber and has no more than one inch of play. The brake pads or linings should be securely mounted and have a minimum of one quarter inch pad depth. Make sure there are no signs of heat cracking or glazing. Finish up by making sure the brake drums and rotors are secure and there is no bluing from excessive heat or debris. Next, move to the tires and wheel rims. Check the tire inflation, depth, and condition. 
use the tire pressure gauge to check for proper inflation. The tire sidewalls should have no cupping, bulging, or retreads on the front steer tires. The tread depth should be 4 32nd inch minimum on steer tires and a minimum of 2 32nd inch on the rear tires. The valve stem should be secure, not damaged, and have a metal cap. Check the wheel rim for dents and illegal welds. Lug nuts must be secure, not broken, loose, or missing, and there should be no shiny threads or rust, which would indicate a loose nut. Make sure the hub seal is securely mounted by its bolts, not leaking, and that the oil level is adequate. When looking at the space between the rear dual tires, make sure they are not touching. There should be no debris, such as sticks, mud, or rocks. Finally, the mud flap should be securely mounted by their bolts. They should not be broken, loose, or missing. As the 360-degree walk-around continues, make sure everything is securely mounted or secured. Anything under 1,100 pounds or 5 feet in length, including items used in the operation of the vehicle, must have at least one tie-down. The mirror brackets and mirrors should not be loose in any way. All of the doors must open and close properly. The steps must be securely mounted by their bolts. They must not be broken, loose, or missing, and free of debris. The fuel tank must be securely mounted by its bolts and straps. There should be no dents or leaks, and the cap should be tight, its rubber seal intact, and the safety chain present. Make sure the workbox doors are securely mounted and latch, and the boom is secured by its bolts and strap, and they are not broken, loose, or missing. The steps to the headache rack should be securely mounted by its bolts and not broken, loose, or missing, and there should be no debris. Finally, check to assure that the outriggers are properly secured in the up position. The outrigger pads and wheel chocks are securely stowed in their holders with a securing device. Continuing the 360 walk around, move to the rear of the truck and check to assure the tailgate is securely mounted to its hinges and its bolts are not broken, loose, or missing. The tailgate pin should be secured by its chain. Next, check the lights and reflectors. Make sure all the lights are the proper color, not broken, loose, or missing, and all the lenses are intact. Don't forget the license plate light. The workbox doors should be securely mounted, not broken or loose, and the box should be securely latched. Check the pintle hitch and the pigtail interface are securely mounted and have no signs of damage. Now, move under the vehicle. Check the frame. Make sure it is not bent or twisted, has no illegal welds, and everything is securely mounted. Check to assure that the drive shaft is securely mounted and is not bent or cracked. Check the universal joints are free of foreign objects, and that the exhaust system is securely mounted with no dents or signs of leaks, such as carbon soot, and all of its original parts must be present. Check to assure that the battery box is secure and its bolts are not broken, loose, or missing. The top, front and side of the box should show no damage or holes. Any unique features to the truck must be securely mounted and there should be no debris of any sort on the outside of the vehicle. Finally, move to the inside of the vehicle. Make sure the required emergency equipment is on board. The fire extinguisher must be fully charged, properly rated and securely mounted. There should be three emergency triangles in their box and a minimum of six replacement fuses. You should have all of the required documents, including the vehicle registration or cap card, insurance card, and the DOT yearly inspection report, pre-trip and post-trip book. Always have your driver's license and DOT physical cards on you. Make sure the seat belts are securely mounted, latch and unlatch, adjust properly, and are not cut or frayed. Now it's time to conduct a safe start. Make sure the parking brake is set, transmission in neutral, and clutch depressed. Then, start the engine and confirm the ABS light comes on and then goes off. Check to see that the engine light goes on and off and confirm the oil gauge, temperature gauge, and ammeter, voltmeter are working and rising to a safe level. After checking all the gauges, grab the steering wheel and tug back and forth to see if there is any play. When the engine is running, power steering equipped vehicles should not exceed 10 degrees of play, which is about 2 inches on a 20 inch wheel. Confirm both mirrors are clean and adjusted to your sight requirements. Visually inspect the windshield to confirm it is secure and there are no cracks or defects. Check each window to make sure they are properly secured, not cracked or broken, and free of illegal stickers and debris. Turn on the wipers and test their movement and washer fluid. Make sure the wiper arms and blades have no damage. Turn on the heater 
defroster, and put your hand over the defrost and under the heat to ensure that both work properly. Test the horn. We don't use these things all the time, but when we need them, they better work. Now it's time to test the lights. While you're inside, make sure all of the dashboard indicator lights work and have a crew member assist you for the external light check. Turn on the left turn signal, the right turn signal, four-way flashers, brake lights, backup, running lights, headlights, and high beams to confirm they all work. Call out each light as you go through them. All lights must work prior to the vehicle leaving the pullout. It's now time to check the brakes for a leak in the system. For an air brake check, use the wheel chocks. With the air pressure built up to governor cutoff of 120 to 140 PSI, shut off the engine. Release the parking brake and fully apply the foot brake and hold it for one minute. The air gauge should not drop more than three pounds in one minute. That would indicate a leak. Now, turn the key to the on position without restarting the vehicle. Rapidly apply and release the foot brake. Low air warning devices should activate before air pressure drops below 60 PSI or level specified by the manufacturer. Continue to fan off the air pressure. At approximately 40 PSI, the parking brake valve should close and pop out. For a hydraulic brake check, the engine will be on. Pump the brake pedal three times and then hold it down for five seconds. The brake pedal should not depress during the five seconds. Now, test the parking brakes. Engage the parking brake and test it by gently trying to pull forward. The vehicle should not move, indicating the parking brake is working properly. For the service brake check, check the application of air or hydraulic service brakes. This procedure is designed to determine the brakes are working. With the parking brake off, pull forward at five miles an hour, apply the service brake and stop. Check that the vehicle does not pull to either side, that would indicate a problem, and that it stops when the brakes are applied. You are now done and have completed the pre-trip vehicle inspection required by Townsend every day. Make sure you fill out the pre-trip paperwork completely and the post-trip or driver vehicle inspection report at the end of each day. The pre-trip inspection should take on average 10 to 20 minutes. It is essential to assure that the day gets started the right way. The better the condition the vehicle, the more smoothly these inspections will go each day. But remember not to take any shortcuts. Don't assume what was good yesterday is okay today. And remember that anything that is faulty or not up to standards requires your immediate attention to either get it fixed or replaced. Do not delay or defer any needed repairs. Safety first and always. Good job and be safe. Okay, that's it. Wow. A lot of data there. Okay, what kind of, what kind of inspection was that? CDL. No, it sure wasn't. Pre -trip. There's a pre-trip inspection required by Townsend. Uh, they missed a lot of details there as far as a CDL pre-trip inspection. There's actually more. And you'll learn that when you get your CDL you get your permit license. Uh, whoever's got your feedback, I may be. Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, Professor V. Yes. We had to do a, a CDL pre-trip inspection every morning before we pulled out. And we had to do a boom inspection if we had a boom out of truck. How about uh, Duke Energy? Yeah. Same thing. We did the, um, what they did, the 360. We did the walk around and we, we looked under, above the truck, you know, those kinds of things. Look for loose bolts, um, oil drips. And then, of course, we did, we called it the pre-flight where we go out there and run the boom up and down. So, yep. Okay, so uh, you know, different companies are going to have different techniques and, and ways of doing it. We did have a form developed, and you just kept those forms in your truck with check boxes beside it. Right. So you had all components in there. You had the components of CDL pre trip, and you had the components of boom inspection. So all we had to do was keep it up on one form, not multiple forms. How long did he say it took? She say it took? About 10, 20 minutes. She said, yeah. 15 to 20. Uh, it's going to take about 30 when it's all said and done with both the boom and the uh, pre-trip inspection. So, you know, I'll just throw this out there. Uh, your work starts at seven o'clock in the morning and uh, you know, load up material and heading out to the job. When are you going to do your pre-trip? Quarter till seven. Who said quarter till seven? Anarillo. 
Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's kind of nice that if you get there 20 minutes till seven, 15 minutes till seven, you know, go ahead and pre-trip your fleet. Uh, are you getting paid for it? Gotcha. Are you making money before cool. seven o'clock? It'll help you make money quicker because you'll be out on the road quicker. Are you make, Are you getting paid to come in early to pre-trip your truck? No, no, you're not. But it you it just makes puts you in good light. Okay, and the boss man walks outside and says, "Let's get let's go. We got our material. Let's go." And you say, "Well, I haven't pre-tripped my truck yet, which takes half an hour." It, it's just nice to say, "All right, we're on the road." You know, and he's going to have right down here in his little black book. Hey, man, this guy's on the stick. He's taking care of his fleet. And uh, it, it's just good. Uh, kudos. Icing on the cake for you guys that if you pre-trip your truck prior to work and including in that, clean it. Make sure there's no trash on it. Fill up a water cooler. Uh, you, you can get the assistance of other guys that are around you. There's going to be a bucket truck. And Professor V can jump in on this too. Typically, we ran a bucket truck, one bucket truck, one line truck, and a flatbed truck, and the supervisor had a pickup. Wow. So that guy in the flatbed truck, and even the guy in the pickup, supervisor, it's going to take them 10 minutes. They don't have as much to inspect, and they'll go help inspect the other fleets before they leave the service center. Yeah. So, you know, just be on good standings <laughs> is yeah. what I'm trying to get across there. Yeah. Now, as far as the pre-trip inspection itself, I understand this. It's going to get redundant. And you think every single day I've got to do a pre-trip? Yes, you do. Because we've had some uh, fleets that have been stopped. What's, what's the department that uh, does fleet inspections? I, I don't know. What is it? It's not the Highway Patrol. Department of Transportation. Yeah, the DOT has got those cars that'll pull trucks over and, and say, do an inspection of your of your truck and make sure you've got all your proper paperwork, your CDL license, your registration, your insurance card, and your physical uh, card. They'll just do all of that. They'll take a walk around the truck, and it is nice to be able to say, "Yeah, I did my pre." He will look for a pre-trip inspection and ask you to provide that also. And it's just nice to have all that stuff in order, good to go. He does a walk around. He looks at that paperwork, and you're on the road again. Also. And I don't know if you might have run into this, Professor V. The first service buckets that we got out there in the world were Fords. And not to say anything against the company Ford, but we started using those. And about every once in a week, the uh, front tire lug nuts would come off. Yeah. Did you have that too? We had the same issue as well. Yep. Yeah. Uh, of course, how did you recognize it the first time? Uh, they were missing a wobbly tire. Yeah. All right, so my guy gets in his fleet to get ready to go on a trouble call. And uh, it's during the, the course of the day, so it got pre-tripped that morning. He just jumps in, it starts taking off, pulls out of the parking lot, the front tire falls off. Yeah. And it was uh, something that could be resolved through different methods of the front tire. But, you know, pre-tripping, at least a doing a walk around every time and looking at the vital parts there is essential for safe operation of the fleet. Just think if that happened at 55, 60 miles an hour. Ooh, bad day. That would have been a disastrous day. Sumter Utilities, and I'm pretty sure they still do this, actually puts sensor points on their fleets and you have to carry a handheld device, do the inspection, wave the sensor, I mean, wave the device over the sensor and that records that you were at that location to be able to do this, to inspect that uh, portion of the truck. And I think they still do that today. So it's, it's vitally important, pre-tripping. Professor B, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I, I had a set of contractors, I can't remember the name of the company, they came from down in Florida, they had the same device, but their trucks would not start until they touched each of those points on the truck. Right, yeah. right. Uh, Another uh, couple of things that I saw in there that were uh, pretty vital and, you know, we, we made some changes in the process. You saw what was what was hooked to the back of that tree trimming truck. Was it hauling a trailer? Chippa. Was it hauling a piece the of chipper. equipment? Yeah, okay. He was hauling a piece of equipment for, behind it. Now, what we did 
of course, you're going to have to have a driver. You're the driver of that fleet. And in order to hook up to that trailer, you're going to have to have uh, some guy behind you guiding up to the trailer. And what would happen there is you would remain in the fleet, make sure that truck stayed in neutral. The guy that helped you back up would connect the trailer to you. And then in the old days, he'd signal you, good to go. All right, we changed that process. Still went through all of that, but once he said finished, the driver has to get out, recheck the connections, fully latched, all the air connections are correct, safety chains are correct, and the uh, safety, uh, safety line as far as trailer loss was all connected. So it was really a double inspection. The guy that hooked up the trailer and the driver has to come back and confirm a trailer hookup. How'd you do it at uh, Duke? The exact same way we, and we did a, you know, just like what you're talking about, hooking up the trailer, checking the connections, because there is a safety rule in Duke's book that says the driver is responsible for anything that goes on. Not, not the passenger, but the driver. So he has the responsibility of getting out, checking to make sure everything's latched in right as well as doing the 360 around the, the pole trailer or flatbed trailer, whatever trailer he's pulling as well. Right, right. I mean, it, it's, it's a sad day when I'm driving my truck, my bucket truck, and I'm ready to hook up to a flat trailer and I get Cam to go back there, hook it up for me. I take off and that trailer comes off the hitch or we have some kind of problem. Yeah. Is Cam responsible? He didn't hook it up, right? Yeah. He's not. The driver is. All right. Cam gets to go home and eat a burger. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any questions as far as what you saw there? I know it, it looks pretty intimidating, but you'll get, in, you'll get into a habit of just doing it all the time and it'll just be a daily thing. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let me uh, bring this up now because things have changed around a little bit. Uh, in speaking with Mark Jones, he will not be here this week. You got that text. He will be here sometime next week. This is probably the most length of time that I've seen him be yeah. able to deliver our tools. I'm pretty sure of that. And it's not his fault. Uh, Buckingham, where he gets most of his stuff, is not able to supply him to bring it. So he wants to have, you know, at least the majority of all the stuff together to bring down in one trip, which I agree with him 100%. So he said he will be down next week. Uh, I want you guys to have time to be in your tools for a little bit before we go to the practice week and then the overhead climbing week. So I'm gonna shift things around here a little bit. We're gonna go to ELW 231. And ELW 231 is electrical power systems. And that's what you saw uh, a little bit of on Monday. And we're gonna continue that today. And we'll probably get a good week's worth in of ELW 231 once our tools get in there. If you guys get your tools, we'll climb a little bit. We'll move back to ELW 114 and complete that process. And then we'll move back to ELW 231, complete that process, and then we'll go to ELW 211 Underground. I know I'm taking it out of order, but I want to utilize the time as the best we can in this process of shifting courses and portions of that around, not to confuse you 100%. You guys are good. So you'll be able to follow this well, but we will be moving into ELW 231. So that's the next course you're gonna to have to reference to as far as D2L is concerned, okay? You're still learning all the same things. I'm just moving the order around a little bit to compensate for timing. Is there any questions there? Sounds like everybody's cooperative with that one. Yeah. Okay. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna get into this morning and what time are we holding? Oh, it's 9.30 already. All right, we'll do this one portion right here and then we'll take a break. What is SCADA? So let me get back to this. Escape that part, share a screen here. Here. Got it. Got it. All right. That was quick. Yeah. Control plus. Let's see. Let's get this a little bit bigger. All right. So, SCADA explain, and I understand it's a little bit small. SCADA is an acronym 
Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition, SCADA, is a system of software and hardware elements that allows industrial organizations to control industrial processes locally or at remote locations, monitor, gather, and process real-time data, directly interact with devices such as sensors, valves, pumps, motors, and more than, and more through human machine interface software and record events to a log file. SCADA uh, in Santa Cooper was introduced in, in the mid eighties. So essentially anything that I needed to do to a substation or a switch as far as automation, working automatically, that didn't exist before those times. Everything that we had to do and no recording of data, everything that had to be done in that process had to be done with a human going to the site, gathering that information or doing that work. Now it's all controlled by a central network through SCADA, the software and the uh, people that are in dispatch. So let's watch this video. We often get asked, what is SCADA? A SCADA system at its most basic is... Sorry, that was me. ...system that's used for controlling, monitoring, and analyzing an industrial process. These systems are used in basically every industrial process in the world. Uh, some examples include water and wastewater systems, petrochemical systems, food and beverage, manufacturing, utilities, the list goes on and on. The SCADA system starts by communicating with, in real time, with the controllers out in the field that are um, running the actual process. Uh, typically, these will be PLCs or RTUs. So the SCADA system will, will gather real time information from these field controllers, and it brings them all into the SCADA system where they are then typically presented using a graphical user interface to the operators that are running the process. This allows the operators to see in real time what the process is doing. They can react to alarms, they can control the process, change settings, things like that. A SCADA system also will often include a, a, some sort of historian product so that this real time process information can be tracked over the long term. This historical data can then be used to create charts, uh, run reports, and that way the operators, in addition to seeing what's currently happening, can see what happened in the past and make predictions about what will happen in the future of their process. At Inductive Automation, we make SCADA software that's easier to use and has less restrictive licensing and is built on modern technology. It's called Ignition, the new SCADA. To learn more about it, visit our website at inductiveautomation.com. Okay, I'll stop that share there. So it's essentially in, in the SCADA world, I mean, different utilities and different industries use SCADA. If you were to think about it, as far as the electrical utility industry, what do you think SCADA is used for, let's say in a substation? To make sure everything runs well now and in the future. Uh, that that's true. Uh, what are the points that you think they are monitoring? All right, and, and and think of here money and real time data. What's the most expensive part of our substation? The transformer. The transformer. transformer. So there. I mean, you can add as many points of monitoring and controlling as you wish. All right, we definitely want to watch the temperature of the transformer. We want to know if the fans are running on the transformer. We want to know the core temperature of the transformer and the oil temperature of the transformer and negative pressure or positive pressure. I mean, there's a lot of data points that are going on here as far as the transformer is concerned. You can add or subtract as needed. All right, I'm not going to have a guy come out of engineering and stand by a transformer all day long to be able to monitor those things. What am I going to use? Skater. Skater, okay, all right. And the gentleman also said, well, I can set alarms on those systems also to be able, if I say the temperature of my transformer is not supposed to get over uh, 80 degrees Celsius, I need to watch it all day long. I'll set an alarm at 81. And once I receive that alarm, now I know what's going on with that uh, piece of uh, transformer process. Now, I've just talked about one component. 
the transformer by your presentations we've got an aci all right that's controlled by scada and monitored by scada the transformer okay we've got potential transformers and current transformers so we're able to monitor bus voltage and bus amperage go to the breaker we're able to monitor amperage and voltage at the breaker because of the potential transformers we can actually open and close it via SCADA. Okay, we're actually able to, when I talked previously before, uh, when we're working on a power line and we're working in the vicinity of those lines, we don't want the uh, breaker to operate normally one time, well, excuse me, one instantaneous and two timed operation. What do we want the breaker to do immediately? Oh, hello. What was that, Scott? The trip. Was that, Scott? The trip. Trip, open. trip open, correct. We want that breaker to trip open immediately. Well, how do I tell the breaker to do that? Do I have to go drive to the substation and throw switches? No, all automated. No. You can call and get a work permit, and they set it that way. Fantastic. All I have to do is call my dispatcher, say I want a hotline work permit. Okay. They send that information to the breaker that I'm working on, and they're able to disable. Uh, and put that breaker in what they call not automatic. I only want a trip open. So it, it definitely saves a lot of time and money as far as travel is concerned and work is concerned as far as the employee is out there in the field. So let me go to the question that uh, it does involve. Do you have it uh, right there in front of you, Professor V? I do. Go ahead. What's yeah. the question? Go ahead. I'm sorry. I walked all over you again. <laughs> it's, it's no problem. Uh, what, what was the question for SCADA? What is SCADA? What is SCADA? And that was multiple choice. That is a note. You got to oh. uh, write out what is SCADA. All right. Yeah. If you were to give, if you were to give in a short term, and I mean layman's term description, what is SCADA? What's its purpose? Supervision of the substation and all the equipment. Okay, and there's more components out there in the world. I just gave the example of the substation. Go back to the acronym. What does SCADA stand for? I guess they got control over all data. Supervisory control, system. Supervisory control and data acquisition, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So monitor and control is for monitoring and controlling components of real time utility system. Okay, use the words that's in the in the acronym. Is to monitor and control components of a utility system. Short and simple. Okay. All right, it is 9.37. Let's say we'll go to 9.47, right around that area. Let's take a little break here and we'll come back. Okay, we're back to 9.47. So we're uh, back here from our break. I did wanna pass on to you, gentlemen, I'm sharing a screen here of a SCADA control center. And this is, uh, you know, just a portion of it right here. Uh, the SCADA control centers, and I think Professor V at Duke is going to say the same thing. Most utilities this way, your dispatchers that are going to dispatch your trouble calls and uh, you're going to work with them as far as relaying information back and forth as your needs as far as SCADA is concerned. Uh, that's a multi-purpose role. So you, you, one thing is you're operating the SCADA system for whatever work needs to be done and monitoring it. Of course, you, you see all this equipment on the bottom. If you have an alarm, it's going to pop up with a red alarm and uh, give you an audible tone in the SCADA control center to be able to uh, bring this up on these different screens right here. Uh, this is really not a big operation. I've seen uh, operations in SCADA control centers that are just huge. Massive. Uh, yeah, and I'm uh, sure it's, it's that way at Duke Energy. Uh, I did want to include here, you know, the uh, college does offer the Lyman course and also, if you continue, you, you can get a two-year degree in electrical lineman and also a two-year degree in electrical engineering, uh, both at the same time. 
you only have to take one more additional course and that uh, has been changed. It's going, it was uh, college 105, which is pretty much, what do I do in a college? Where's the library? Where's the cafeteria and whatnot? That's uh, been changed to uh, a course in supervision, which is only, uh, I think three credits. So the college does offer that. And uh, if you want to check into it, that's fine and dandy. You'd be able to get a two-year degree in electrical lining and a two-year degree in electrical engineering in two years in one course. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much what's required as far, the electrical engineering part is what's required here to be able to work in a SCADA control center. Uh, that's probably at the minimum too. They're looking for two and four year degree people. So that is a job option really is what I'm getting at. Uh, if, if you wanna go that direction, I think I've had three students that have gone to SCADA control centers mm -hmm. and are, are doing well at their jobs. Uh, one was multilingual. So that, that was very much, he, he was a Mexican and he was multilingual. So they wanted him real bad. He was able to sp speak uh, to uh, the customers that spoke uh, Mexican only. So uh, he got hired at a very, very high amount of money. So I did just wanted to put that out there. If, if you're interested in this, it's going to take the EE and ELW degree. You know, me, my opinion, uh, I'm an outside guy. Mm -hmm. This is an inside job. I, I mean, for eight hours straight, you're going to be inside. And it, it's shift work also, too. Uh, the SCADA control center and the dispatch center has to be manned 24 seven. So there's going to be shift work involved also. Some people like the shift work, some people don't. Yep. But I did want to pass that on to you. Is it, if you got any questions there, you got anything that you want to speak further with me or Professor Vermelin about, just let us know. Uh, pays real well. Yep. Uh, and I consider it a geek job, which I'm a geek, but uh, it is out there in the world. Okay. So I'm going to move on here to, uh, and I'm able to actually, you know, kind of bring up the questions, Professor V, and then discuss them as we go along. Mm -hmm. This uh, component was in your presentations. What are we looking at here on screen? Voltage regulators. Voltage regulators. Okay, we discussed this briefly before when we were going through the book for ELW 112. There, there's another name for this piece of equipment. Then we've got one per phase, one voltage regulator per phase. And it was in the transformer po portion when we were talking about different types of transformers. We had a just a regular single phase transformer. We had a three phase transformer. We had a current transformer. What's another name for a voltage regulator? Does anybody remember that component? All right, let me go with this question. Does a voltage regulator transform voltages? Auto uh, transformer. Excuse me? Yes. It, yes, it does transform voltages. Yes. Remember, I've it got- maintains it. Right, I've got to stay in that plus- five percent. Right, I've got to maintain that plus or five, minus 5%. So it will trans, transform voltages, but only by plus or five, minus 5%. So my system stays within compliance. So does it, am I having to do chap changing? Am I have to do this? Do I have to go to the substation to do it? That plus or minus 5%? No. No. So does it, so does it, it's done automatically, correct? Yes. All right. Transformer. So, what, it's an automatic what, transformer. Yeah, it's an auto transformer. So another name for a, for a reg, voltage regulator is an auto, auto transformer. And that's what you're looking right here in this process. Okay, good. Yeah. Like, and you are seeing my share screen, right? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Now, some of these questions we've, we've uh, already previously been through, but we're going to retouch on them. What does ACI stand for? Automatic circuit interrupter. Okay. So in the question, you'll see this. And I know this takes a little time. I don't know why it takes so long. All right. Data, data Center Network, Air Cargo Incorporated, American Concrete Institute, automatic circuit interrupter. So you know what your choice is going to be there. Okay. All right, so I got to go do a drawing for this one. We're gonna have a little bit more learning on what the breaker is about. So I'm gonna switch off of this screen. 
and I'm going to go to share screen and where's my untitled paint? Share. Okay. Do you see a share screen now for Microsoft Paint? Yes, sir. Okay. So let's talk more in depth about the uh, circuit breaker and the breaker in a substation. Get a pencil. Thank you. Let me get a line, color. All right, we're going to be looking at the panel on the front of a breaker inside a substation. When you open a door and you look inside the breaker panel, and we're going to talk about the two different types of panels that are in use nowadays. Okay, so in this breaker panels, and we've seen this before, using our CTs, current transformers, and PT, potential transformers, current for amps, PT for voltage, we're taking that information that we're getting from those, you know, those measurements that we talked about before, and we're sending that information to relays. And we all know the pur purpose of CTs and PTs. You know, this relay is a all the relays in here are a component of equipment that I can't put 900 amps to. All right, it's gonna burn it up. I've got to transform it first. So that's all being transformed. You got CT information, CT measurements. And PT measurements. coming into my relays, all right? The components that as far as the relays are concerned, and here we go, A, B, C, and G. What do I mean by those letter designations? Do I need to monitor all three phases? in and out of my breaker. Yes. All right, you, yes, you have to, okay? You're not gonna measure one individual one, you're gonna have to monitor all, all three. Do I also have to measure what kind of uh, voltage or, sorry, that's a bad letter designation. I'll get that squared away right there. What's on my neutral and ground? Yes. Okay, so I have to monitor that that too, if it gets too imbalanced, I need to do something with it. So all of these that I have, the A, the B, and the C are phase relays. The G is obvious, is a ground relay. of vital importance here. This is what those relays will do as far as the mechanical operation of the breaker. All four of these relays, A, B, C, and G, trip open only. O, N, L, Y. <laughs> Their only purpose in this breaker is to trip the breaker open. So if my CT or PT information goes over its limits, these relays will trip the breaker open. I'm gonna put an R in this relay down here. R equals reclosing. relay. Okay. A, B, C, and G will trip it open. Which relay will reclose it? R. R. Okay. Then I've got my manual in the middle here. Manual 
open or close. And then this handle right here, manual tagging relay. Okay, so what we've gotten this far, let's, let's go over this real quick. I'll ask this question. How many total relays are in a breaker panel? Total. Seven. Four. One, two, three, four. Five. Five. Five total relays. I didn't specify either you know, a trip relay or a reclosing relay. Five relays total. All right, which relays open the breaker? A, B, C, and G. A, B, C, and G open a breaker. Which relay closes the breaker? R. R recloses the breaker. Good. Good synopsis. Good. Uh, uh, work right there as far as that. Now I've got to have a fallback gentlemen, just in case my SCADA system goes haywire or, you know, say I've got an outage or a software problem or anything like that, you've got to have some type of fallback in this situation. If I need to open or close the breaker manually, I can use the manual open or close right here in the center. That's for safety purposes, okay? If I need to get, and we'll talk about this on the hotline work permit in just a moment. If I need a hotline work permit and I need to disable reclosing, I need to be able to do manual tagging. That's in that process right there. We'll go more into emphasis on our next screen on this portion. Okay, so I've got some kind of, you know, I've got uh, a manual process just in case I have a failure of SCADA. All right, one more component in here, and it's over, and they're typical all in the same uh, location as far as you're looking in the panel, is what they call a local remote. Okay, any kind of ideas of what local remote means? Okay, nothing going on there. If this is in remote, it's SCADA controlled. Okay, SCADA is controlling it. They have full control of the breaker. In local, I'm taking the remote operation away from this breaker. So I, I can actually do things. I can turn knobs and turn handles in this breaker and it, it's gonna function that way. But in remote, I don't have any control over the breaker or what I do inside of it. Only for one function, and this is for safety reasons only. In local or remote, I can open the breaker. So let me ask you this question right here. If I am in remote and the breaker is already open, can I close it? No. No. I'm still in remote. That's a safety feature right here. I'm gonna have to get permission to go to local and then be able to close the breaker. I'm gonna flip that around. I'm in remote. Can I open the breaker? It's already open. No, let's say it's closed right now. Well, yeah, I mean, you can open. Right. For safety reasons, I'm able to open it, okay? That's a safety reason. That's the only control and only thing that you're gonna be able to do in a breaker panel while still in remote. Now I can move it from remote to local and open it, but to save, save time in the process, I can go straight into the breaker panel, hit open and the breaker will hum. open. That's for safety purposes. All right, any questions thus far? That's a lot of information. We're being recorded, so you'll be able to reference back to that. But the major components here, five relays total. All right, which relays open the breaker? Which relay 
closes the breaker. And what your handle ABC purpose is. And G right. opens and R closes. Right. Right. And what the purposes of your handles are inside a breaker. Now, I, I will admit, and uh, Professor V, you can come into this also. Mm -hmm. uh, SCADA is pretty reliable. Right. Right. Uh, I've only known of uh, three instances in my career where I've had to go to a substation and do things inside a circuit breaker as far as opening or closing the breaker or making any kinds of adjustments. Even at that, it's good for you guys to be familiar. You might have to just open the door in this thing and take a look and give information back to, the, to a dispatcher. Or you might already be in a substation doing an inspection and you're going to have a skate of failure, or the skate of might, you know, we, we did have instances where skate was taken down for software upgrades. And the dispatch was informed me that, that somebody's going to say, I need you to open breaker. Uh, we'll say this is SRA again. I need you to open this breaker. We've got an emergency. Well, what handle do you need to turn? It's, and it's written right on the handle, open, close. I go to open with it. I don't even have to worry about remote or local in that process, okay? That's a safety feature that's going on right there. Yeah. All right. So let's start a new one. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the uh, manual tagging and uh, reclosing relay. All right, so I'm gonna draw just that relay. And I'm gonna draw, and this has got a handle on it. It's got a little window in it. Okay, and this is my R relay, reclosing relay only. What's the purpose of the reclosing relay? Close. to reclose okay its purpose is only to close the breaker the other purposes of the other relays are to open it mm -hmm. all right in some cases and this is dependent on the utility you work for some utilities don't have SCADA or in some processes out there uh, you might not have SCADA to be able to control the breaker when I get a hotline work permit we're going to jump back to that real quick what do we want the breaker to do in case there's a fault? And I know you've answered this multiple times before. Give it to me again. Prep. Open. Open and not Open. what? Not reclose. Not Close. reclose. So this is a simple process here as far as the electronics are concerned. I want to turn the re reclosing relay off. That's all that handle does. Okay, when I turn it to a off in that position, this turns either orange or red. It's normally black. Okay. As soon as I turn that handle to off, you're going to get a red flag in there. So that's a visual indication that the reclosing relay is off. That's why they call it a tagging relay. Okay. I'm tagged, and how did you call your uh, hotline work permits, Professor V? Hotline tag. There it is. All right, he has now got a hotline tag. He has taken the reclosure and essentially turned it off. Right. All right. Obviously, you know, this is gonna, if you do need to do this manually, it's gonna have an off on, tells you which way to turn it. This is gonna turn red. If it was SCADA controlled, there's just a motor behind here. SCADA is going to send a signal when you get a hotline work permit. It's going to turn this handle by, up by a motor in the back, and it's going to turn the, re the reclosing relay off. Plain and simple. All right, that's the same thing on the breaker handle. Let me turn back to my normal color here. Okay, it's got a red and a green. All right, that's open. This direction is closed. Now, Professor E, you can probably uh, help me out on this too, as far as the schemes that you've seen before. Right. I'm going to have a red light. 
and I'm going to have a green line. Correct. I got those backwards, don't I? <laughs> mm -hmm. I do. Opens green, yeah. All right, so we're going to go red hot. Uh, like we talked about before. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to go green. Green up. Okay. You're going to get one, uh, a handle turn to open. You're going to get a green flag in the middle, and you're going to get a green light. That signifies open. If you manually close it, turn the handle to the right hand side. Okay, you're going to get a red flag and you're going to get a red light. Simple indications in the breaker. Do not trust the lights. Do not trust the flag. Do not trust the handle 100%. They are simple indicators that the breaker is open, correct? Correct. All right. As far as the line is concerned, what do I need to do before I start working on it? Testing. Anybody. Any line that I work on, what do I need to do? Test it. Test it. Test and ground. Okay. In the early days when we had manual op manual operation of breakers, we didn't have SCADA yet. The guy would go to the substation, he would twist it open. He would say, I've got a green flag. I've got a green light. You can go ahead and start your work. We changed that terminology. I've got a green flag. I've got a green handle. I've got a green flag. I've got a green light. You need to test and ground prior to starting your work. We changed our terminology here, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, one other thing, and we're gonna get into this more in the quiz also. If I need to work on the breaker and I've got green, green, and green, can I go ahead and start work? If you no. tested it first. What component am I missing as far as working on the breaker itself? Why do I have Switching. a there, Who said that, Reggie? Yeah. What's the purpose of my line and bus side disconnects? Visual open points. Two yep. visual open points, fantastic. I've got to have two individual open points before I work on anything inside the breaker. All right. The green handle, the green flag, and the green light are indicators only. I still have to follow the rules of two visual open points before I can start working inside the breaker panel or anything on top of it. Okay, so let's bounce back to the question. We were on question four, what does an ACI stand for? Question uh, five, how many relays are in a substation breaker? Yeah. All right. Five. Right. What's the purpose of a voltage regulator? Okay. Not another definition. What's its purpose? Hold on one second. I'll give you your choices. Yeah, All right. Choice number one, protect feeder from faults. Choice number two, raise or lower feeder capacitance. Number three, raise and lower substation voltage. Number five, raise and lower feeder voltage. Three. Three. One, two, three. Raise and lower substation voltage. Is that your answer? Yes. All right. Look at your presentation, gentlemen. This all couples back to your presentations you made. I went substation breaker, voltage regulator, then feeder. So what's it monitoring? The feeder or the substation? Feeder. 
Right. So is its purpose to raise and lower feeder voltage? Do I want the plus or minus 5% on my feeder system? Do I want to maintain that plus or five mi minus 5% on my yes. feeder line? Yes. yes. So our answer would be raise and lower feeder voltage. And that's what's actually attached to. That's the last component before it goes out onto the feeder. Okay. All right, let's see here. All right, so let's talk, we'll go back on your presentations. File, new. Let's say, all right, I'm going to draw out uh, what you had, you guys had in your presentations. You came from transmission to a high side switch to an ACI to the transformer. Who can tell me what the definition for ACI is? Automatic circuit interrupter. Automatic circuit, Automatic circuit interrupter. So I've got transmission, my high side switch, my ACI, my XFMR, and my low side switch. And that was the start off components of your uh, PowerPoint presentations. All right, how expensive is my substation transformer? A couple million. Yeah, a couple million dollars, okay. On a substation breaker, we talked about this previously. Our system, what they use, it was programmed, was an I and two Ts. I want to try to clear a fault. All right, so I give it an I and two Ts. That's actually three operations in total. All right, do I, if I have a fault anywhere between the transformer all the way up to the breaker, okay? The ACI monitors from itself all the way up to the breaker, then the breaker takes over for the feeder line. If I have a fault between the ACI up to the breaker, do I want three operations to happen? <laughs> no. No, I only want one. And I want it to be instantaneous. I want one instantaneous operation, okay? Fault, overload, whatever the case right may be. Remember, I've got CTs and PTs in the transformer. I've got CTs and PTs on the bus and the breaker. So it's monitoring everything in between. If any of those go over the value they're specified for, I want the ACI one I operation, All right? And that's, I know it's kind of, we're really getting tight here as far as protection is concerned. But guys, the time involved and the money involved to change this thing out is huge. So we want a lot of protection on the transformer right there. The question will be, during a fault, an ACI, and this is true or false, will go through three operations. True or false? False. False. Okay, great. Um, when you say one eye, is that one eye open or one eye Recurve. One eye open. I mean, essentially, this whole zone between the ACI up to the circuit breaker has a hotline work permit on it. It's the way it stays all the time. So any fault or overcurrent, any problem overload we have between those two sections, the ACI up to the breaker is going to trip open, and that's going to be it. Good question. Okay. Uh, we talked about this previously when we were talking about I and T targets on a breaker and I and T operations. When a breaker will not close anymore automatically, what state is it in? So I had I, T, and what was the third state where I needed human in intervention? Local. Local. You're going to have open. Oh. You're going to have open and closes between your I and T's all the time. When it gets to the end, when it's done with the three operations, what state is the breaker in? Lockout. Lockout. Great. 
right? The breaker is locked out. I need some kind of human intervention. All right. Simple question here, and don't overthink this. What does the reclosing relay do? Reclose the breaker. Recloses the breaker. Fantastic. All right. Recloses the breaker. What relays will open a feeder breaker? Which relays? If R, we've got five total. If R is the only one that will close it, what's left? A, B, C, G. A, B, C, G. C and G, correct, 100%. Those are the only ones that will open the breaker. Okay. Uh, all right, we just discussed this. Let me get over to it. If I can find my mouse. <clears throat> Let's start a new one over here. Well, I can leave this one. And this is true or false. An ACI protects equipment between the distribution breaker to the ACI. We just discussed this. My breaker down here at the bottom is protection for my, oops, sorry, wrong color, is protection for my feeder on out, that's what it's monitoring, between the breaker and the ACI, all the way back to the ACI, that's what's being monitored. So I'm gonna ask a question again, an ACI protects equipment between the distribution breaker, this point right here, all the way back to the ACI at this point right here. True or false? True. Mm -hmm. Everything in between ACI to breaker is monitored and controlled by the ACI, either opening or closing. So it, I've got transformer, I've got a uh, bus, all your PT and CT equipment in between, all the way up to the bushings of the breaker where it comes in, all right? Then in the breaker, the bushings that come out, that is looking at all the feeder that goes out onto the feeder line. You definitely don't want, and this is what's uh, why we have, I know you've seen that video out there. I might bring it up later on. If you went up and saw arc flash or put arc flash in a video right there, that one substation that catches on fire by the golf course and then eventually blows up. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I mean, we looked into that and saw what was going on there. You had a breaker going out of the feeder you had bus, all right? And I'm not gonna draw all the components because we wanna go to the ACI. You had the substation transformer. See if you can bring that thing up, Professor V, while we're doing this. All right, then you had the ACI down here. That was actually in the process, that was a feeder fault, okay? The breaker did not open. You had a problem there in the breaker. So that fault current is going all the way back through the bus, down to here, through the transformer and up to the ACI. So we had a problem at the breaker and the ACI had a blown uh, fuse. Uh, I mean, the fuse is 50 cents, okay? It had a blown, like a fuse you're gonna put in your car. Right, so essentially, it fault current at this location traveling all the way through, going down to here, going through here, and started going out on the transmission line. Actually, so it, it what did it burn up? Breaker, bus, the transformer actually gets so hot that it starts spewing oil out and it explodes. I got it. Go ahead. Let me get stop share here. Okay. See it? Got it, go. Let's pause it right there. Okay. You'll see uh, the breaker is essentially, and that's the breaker you see the fire right now, it's essentially burning up. 
it just cannot handle the fault current that's going into the uh, coming from the fault that's happening out there in the field. If you look over here, you see the transformer on the left hand side, his mouse said, look, go over a little bit more. That's the ACI. It's got a blown 50 cent, 50 uh, cent fuse in it that actually turns the motor to open the switch. So it's just staying locked closed. Keep going. At that point right there, you see that that's the oil, the pressure inside the transformer has gotten so high that the oil has become vaporized and it's blowing out of the lid of the transformer. Go ahead. Boom, it ignites. Pretty cool, pretty cool video, all right? All over what? A 50 cent fuse. Oh, full. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all over a 50 cent fuse. All right, let me get my share back in line here. Thank you, Professor. Oops. Okay. Wrong share. Stop share. Can you guess which one of these two? Yeah, can, can you guess? <laughs> I'm going to share this one right here. We're back to this. All right, so we've answered that question. An ACI protects equipment between the distribution breaker to the ACI. We have got that as a true answer right there. What time we hold them, boss? Mm, 10.25. All right, let's, uh, let's come back in about 10. Let's say about 10.35. Roger. Okay. Okay, next question. And uh, this came back from safety videos and discussions with both Professor V and uh, myself regarding safety in a substation. Uh, and it's a written answer. What safety equipment is required for you to enter a substation? Hmm. Don't, don't overthink this. What's your normal PPE you have to have on yourself when you get ready to start work? Hard hat. Yep, or part hat one. Leather gloves. Protection. Uh, leather gloves. Uh, it's good to have leather gloves. What was the other one? Somebody said protection. Eye protection. Eye protection. That's one, two, three. FR clothing. Ooh. FR clothing. That's four. Safety toes, shoes. Uh, safety toes, shoes, boots. Okay. Think Anybody else? Glasses. Protection. Typically in a substation, because substations don't contain any noise, that is the minimum required. What we've gone through thus far is the minimum required equipment that you're going to need to go in a substation. Now, if, here, if noise becomes a problem, Cam, you're 100% correct. You're going to put ear protection on. But the minimum requirements of walking into a substation are a hard hat. We'll start from the top down. Hard hat eyeglasses, safety glasses, uniform, right, leather gloves, and steel toe safety boots or shoes. As work commences or anything that you need into the future, you're gonna add on as much, what you need as far as that's concerned. If you need to work on something energized, you're gonna put your rubber gloves on, right? Or you're gonna need you know, rubber coverage, you're gonna add that. But just to step your foot inside a substation and walk around and inspect, those items were the minimum items that you needed to be able to go into substation. Professor V, have I hit all the points as far as Duke is concerned? Absolutely, same thing. Okay, great, fantastic. All right, I lost my mouse, there it is. A voltage regular, I'll ask this question straight out, A voltage regulator raises or lowers voltage by what percentages? Here's your uh, choices. 1.7325, 1.5, plus or minus 10%, plus or minus 5%. Watch out on that answer. 
Plus or minus five percent. Plus or minus five for the full ten, right? If you go ten percent high, that's that's out of range, or ten percent low, that's out of range. Plus or minus five percent is the acceptable range. You guys are tracking along good here. All right. Hmm. I got my share screen up here, so we'll go into this. Uh, we pre previously discussed before, we've got, get right here, phase relays. And one new one we've included here, when it was not new, one new condition we're going to include here, A, B, C, and G. All right. What were the two conditions that we know of thus far that will make a breaker trip open? There was two. And we discussed the differences between the two. Overload. Would that make a breaker trip open? Yes. All right, what was the other one? Fault. Fault. U L T. Now, when you have an overload, that means my phases A, B, or C went overload. And if I have a fault on my phases, either A, B, or C have a fault in it. Where does the G relay figure into this? Overload covered by the relay, A, B, or C. Fault cover covered by the relay, A, B, or C. Why do I have a ground relay? Now, I don't expect, I mean, this is gonna be a guess, I'm sure from you guys. Keep it balanced. Oh, Metrovan, you are tracking 100% on that. Okay. From our discussions that we had before on secondary and a couple instances on primary, if I have, we'll say 500 amps and it's within range and 500 amps on this one and we have zero on C, where does that imbalance of amperage travel? Where does it go? Did you? Right, it follows the neutral and it's gonna to go to the ground relay. I don't have overload. I don't have fault, but I definitely have a situation here. For one thing, everything three phase on the circuit is not gonna operate correctly. All right, we're gonna start burning up some motors because I have only two phases operating and not the third, okay? In that situation there, I'm not in good shape. I don't wanna burn up people's equipment. The imbalance of load is gonna travel the neutral back to ground and what's the ground relay going to do? Drip. Drip. Drip open, all right? You're not gonna have any kind of uh, information going to here. None going to here. The C is reading zero, it's not an overload, it's not a fault either. But ground's gonna sense, I've got load, too much load, following the, loot to the neutral because of load imbalance, it's gonna trip the breaker. Okay, that's another feature as, as protection is concerned. So the question reads, what are three reasons for a breaker to open? To open? Here are your answers. Squirrels, pelicans, and snakes. <laughs> <laughs> a timed operation and an instantaneous operation and load imbalance. A fault, animal mitigation, or load imbalance. And last but not least, a fault, and watch your screens, a fault, an overload, or load imbalance. Does that satisfy all three? Yes, sir. It does. 
What are three reasons for a breaker to open? Well, overload, it's gonna make my breaker trip open. Fault, it's gonna make it trip open. Load imbalance, going to the ground relay, that's gonna make it trip open also. Well done. Trevon, great, great work there, man. When you said, when you said load balance, you were right on it. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. What are the four types of arc extinguishing mediums? Ha ha. Yeah. I've already seen that video before. Yeah. File, new. Don't say. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to even gonna go into this one. Give, give them to me, guys. Four air. Medium. air. Oil. Oil. Vacuum. Vacuum. Did you want to include an air puffer breaker? Well, air, when we include air, th that covers all everything that's included in air. I'm only asking for four. SF6. SF6, fantastic. Great. All right. 16. <coughs> well, new. Don't say. What are the two types of breaker operations? One of them, I want to be very fast. The other ones, I want to wait a little bit. What do we call those? Instantaneous the and time. Instantaneous and time. Fantastic. Great. You guys are paying attention and I appreciate it. All right. I'm not going to give any kind of indication on this one. See what you guys remember. How fast is an instantaneous operation? Three to five wave cycles. Three to five cycles. Correct. My answers are, and you can use this as an answer too, 20 seconds, 10 seconds, 60 hertz, two to five cycles. Which one are you going to pick? Two to five cycles. Five cycles. Two to five cycles. There you go. Fantastic. All right. Okay. So we went into this uh, shortly <coughs> on our last video, and you can reference both videos here. We'll have this one today on the last one. And another good tool to use on this quiz right here is your uh, PowerPoint presentations, if you want to use uh, use those also. So we went and we discussed. We have a breaker. And we've got our feeder line. And if you remember here, I had a pole. And here's good old Professor Vermelin in his bucket truck. Yeah. All right, I don't draw trucks very well. Wheels, wheels. Okay, and here he is <laughs> working on the circuit, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, and remember our, our feeder is gonna extend you know, all over the place. Okay, and I'm just going to draw pole positions right here. Okay. So the question's going to read in this process. Professor Vermin is right here, and he's just hung a brand new transformer. He's got a switch right here. He's got a hotline work permit, just like he should have in this situation. Brand new transformer guys in this process, even if it's one that you've repaired or done some work on, he's getting ready to close this switch. Should he or does he have to cancel his hotline work permit? He's closing this with a stick and he's away from it. No. Anybody else? Okay, Tim, uh, why, why would you say no? Um, and let, let me emphasize, he's using a, a long stick, a 10 foot stick. He's not making any physical contact of the feeder and he is backed away. Mm -hmm. 
All right, let me so give you this. There's worse than this, three. Let me give you this scenario then. He closes the switch. He's got a hotline work permit. He closes the switch and it blows the fuse. What will the breaker do? Trip open if tennis. Trip open. Okay. It's doing what it's meant to do. It's going to recognize a fault. It's going to trip open. For the purposes of me not working in vicinity and I'm using the stick, do I want one transformer failure to take out my entire circuit? No. No, you do not. So what do I need to do with a hotline work permit? Cancel it. Right. You have to cancel your hotline work permit whenever you're energizing new pieces of equipment. That includes lines, transformers, underground wires, capacitor banks, anything that you're prepared to energize, you have to cancel. Is that how you spell cancel? C-A-N-C. There you go. That's better. Uh, you have to cancel your hotline work permit. Close the switch. Now, if you need to resume your work, you can get the hotline work permit back. Yep. But only for the purposes of energizing new or repaired equipment, you have to cancel that hotline work permit. And you are still following safety rules. You're away from the feeder a sufficient distance. Right? You're using a stick with your rubber gloves and all your safety gear on. And the purpose here eventually is, I want the fuse to blow. Hey, that's loud. That was loud. I want the fuse to blow and do what it's supposed to do. And I want the, the breaker to have an instantaneous and reclose as quick as possible. In order for that to happen, I have to cancel my hotline work permit. <laughs> so when the question as it reads you must cancel a hotline work permit to close a fuse true or false true false wow <laughs> who said false didn't you say it has to uh, after you close it when you must cancel a hotline work permit to close a fuse Oh, I thought you said before you close a fuse. You must cancel a hotline work permit to close a fuse. Well, you're going to have to do it before you close it. Correct? Yeah. Mr. Santorella, if I close the fuse and I've, and I've got a hotline work permit and I've got a fault down here, it's going to take out the breaker. No, I don't want to do that. I've got to cancel my hotline work permit before I close the fuse. Otherwise, I'm going to take out my entire theater circuit. Okay? Yep. Understood. Great. All right. We're getting close to the end. Left. I did? No, I said there's two left. Two left, yeah. Yeah, two left feet. All right. Question. We just discussed this. Why is there a tagging relay in a breaker? Remember the tagging relay. It was right next to the reclosing relay. A, it's a handle to close the breaker. B, it's an OSHA required tag for a hotline work permit. And remember, Professor V calls it in his organization a hotline tag. All right, to make sure you don't get tagged. What? All right. And to let you know there is a hotline work permit. Okay. What's the best answer out of those things? Is it, I'll give you this. It is OSHA required. Which answer answers out of all those three? Handle to close breaker. OSHA required tag for a hotline work permit to make sure you don't get tagged, to let you know there is a hotline per work permit. OSHA required. OSHA required. Now remember, this is normally gonna be controlled by SCADA, correct? Mm -hmm. So are you, 
are you going to be out here? We'll use this drawing. Professor V has got a hotline work permit here. Does he have to ride back to the substation and look at the tag before he comes back out here and resumes his work? No. No, he does not. But anybody that goes to the substation and opens the door and sees a red tag, we had it in the tag, in the, re in the uh, reclose and relay handle, he cannot do anything with that breaker. All right. Uh, and I will give it, there's good communication that's going to be going on. But as far as we were concerned, and Professor V, let us know how your communication systems work. Mm -hmm. We had a channel for Myrtle Beach distribution. We had a channel for North Myrtle Beach distribution. We had a channel for Garden City distribution. And we had a channel for Conway distribution. All right. There's a lot of radio traffic going on. Uh -huh. So, and then you had a channel for the relay group. And you had a channel for switching, and you had a channel for the substation maintenance group. Yes. So in, in normal daily use, you're going to only hear traffic, radio traffic that pertains to you and the uh, service center that you're going to be working for. So if I'm working on the circuit, I'm talking with the dispatchers, I've got a hotline tag on that circuit, and I've got a substation maintenance guy that's simply going into the substation and doing some maintenance or relay guy and he opens that breaker panel up, what's he gonna see? I'm circling it real bunches and bunches. Red tag. He's gonna see a red tag and he knows right then, I need to contact the dispatchers and see what's going on with this breaker. I will not be able to do anything with it. It's got to be visual, red. So it's an OSHA required indication. All right, last but not least. Wow. <coughs> New. Don't say. Here's my five relays. A, B, C, G, R, question. When taking the question, it would appear as, which relay is disabled for a hotline work permit? A, B, C, G, or R? R. 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 Fantastic. And the breaker to reclose. So when I get a hotline work permit, the reclosing relay is disabled. Professor V. Yes, sir. Anything you'd like to include? No, sir. That is awesome. Ma'am, take a look at the time, guys. Mm -hmm. I am on Tierra del Fuego. Yep. Okay. Reminder, gentlemen, this quiz will be in ELW 231. 112 is complete. Professor V and I are going to be grading the uh, presentations, uh, throwing your exam grades in today. So that's done and over with. And I, I will say this, and I think I'm sure Professor V will back it up. Great job. Great job. Yep. Everybody got their work done on time. I haven't looked at all the <laughs> PowerPoints. Everybody yep. got their work done on time. You guys were very efficient. Oh, this is probably one of the first classes I've ever had where I've not had to reassign quizzes or tests right. for, for a later time. You guys are doing a fantastic job as far as your D2L work is concerned. Keep it up. Any questions? All right, last but not least, I know I've got some COVID people that are out there or at least people that are having to quarantine or whatnot. Uh, the days that you're not coming out to the field, we will make adjustments. We did the uh, transformer simulators yesterday. It, this is a nice thing about having Professor V and myself together. We follow the same course lines, you know, word for word here. So with the two of us, Professor V or myself, will be able to attend to the students as far as climbing and the rest of courses are concerned. And we will be, uh, the other professor will be able to catch you up on what's been missed so far out there at the field. So don't get concerned or uh, worried about your situation out there. We will accommodate. Professor V, anything you'd like to add on that part? 
nope, just can't wait to get you out, back out there and get you back in stride with everything what we're doing. That that's the truth. And you know, the, you you guys are not the first. Right. We've had to do this before. I think we're pretty good at it, and uh, we are in the uh, status of no man left behind. So. Yep. We're good to go on that point. Any questions by anybody out there? All right, so let's go ahead and be prepared for the posting of the quiz. We will send that in remind when it is available. Uh, be prepared for the posting of the video and uh, use that accordingly. Remember, it takes a little time for that to process and upload. And uh, I think we'll be good to go if there's nothing anybody else. I did, I did comment and I'll just say this again, Mark Jones will be here next week. And that was his answer next week. Yeah. What day, what day I don't know. Okay, he's got a schedule to follow also. All right, gentlemen, if there's nothing further, uh, if anybody wants to hang around after, by all means do so. Call it a day for today. <laughs>